Okay, so in this lesson, I plan to show you how to analyze a chord progression by going through an example. And I'm going to use the first half of the jazz standard, My Romance. Now, analyzing a chord progression is partially subjective. There are a number of different ways you can analyze the same chord progression. So the way I'm going to do it is not the only way you can do it. I've got my own personal preferences and biases, which I will try to explain to you as we go. And unfortunately, learning how to analyze a chord progression well only comes with practice. There are certain patterns and cliches that you discover only by analyzing lots of different jazz standards. So the general steps I take when analyzing a chord progression are as follows. First, analyze the overall form of the song. Next, analyze the first level chord progression, which looks at each individual chord as a separate entity. Then analyze the second level chord progression, which looks at functionality and only takes account of the structurally important chords, ignoring the immaterial passing chords. Now, what's an important and what is an unimportant chord is to an extent subjective, but again, you get better at this with practice. Then after analyzing our chord progression, we'll discuss what this actually means in practice for improvisation. So first, you look at the overall form of the song. For this, you look at the number of bars in the song and the number of sections. Now in jazz, some common forms are the 12 bar blues, the 32 bar AABA, the 32 bar ABAC, and the 16 bar AB song form. So looking at My Romance, we see that it's 32 bars long and follows an ABAC form. Right? Easy. So moving on. Next, we look at the first level chord progression. To do this, first we determine the key. So you find the key signature, and then you look for cadences at the end of phrases or sections. So look for two five ones or five ones or two fives, which are just incompleted cadences that resolve to the one at the beginning of the next section. Or if it's a blues, look for four one plagal cadences at the end of phrases. Now doing these things will help you determine the key of the song. And then we'll label all chords with Roman numerals based on their relationship to the tonic chord or the one chord. Now, if we look at My Romance, we see that the key signature is C major. We also see that section A ends with a 2-5-1 in C, with the C7 then being a kind of pickup or anacrusis chord leading to the next section. And section B ends with an incomplete 2-5 in C. So I think it's pretty clear that this song is written in the key of C major. Next, we label all the chords with Roman numerals based on their relationship to the one chord or to the C major seven chord. And I find it helps to write out all the diatonic chords of the key, just for your own reference. And I'm just gonna use a write out of all the chords rather than the lead sheet, just so it's a little bit less messy and clearer. So then we see the song begins on the one chord, followed by the four chord, then the minor three and the minor six, or if you like, the flat three diminished. You can choose either one of those chords. Then we have that two, five, one, followed by a three dominant to the six, three dominant again, six, then six dominant to a two, five, one again. Then the one dominant to the four, a flat seven dominant to the one, a one dominant to the four, a flat seven dominant to the one again. And on the last line, we have the sharp four half diminished, followed by a seven dominant, a minor three, a flat seven dominant, a minor six, a two dominant, and a two, and then a five. Right, so that was us just analyzing the chord progression on the first level. So just writing out each of the chords relationship to the tonic. Now, this doesn't tell you a hell of a lot, but it's a start. Next, we look at the second level chord progression. Now on this level, we're looking to reduce the first level progression to its simplest form by getting rid of all the unimportant chords and keeping only the structurally important chords. And in this way, we analyze the progression in terms of the function of each chord. 
Now, if you don't know what functionality is, I have a separate video on this, which you can go and watch, that explains this topic. But essentially, we want to reduce each chord into one of three categories, predominant, dominant, or tonic. The predominant pulls or wants to resolve to the dominant, and the dominant pulls or wants to resolve to the tonic. Now, this is a very important concept, and you should go watch my video on functionality before continuing so that you can follow what I'm about to explain. Now, functional chord progressions generally move from the tonic to the predominant to the dominant, and then either stop there or move back to the tonic, depending on whether it's a complete or an incomplete cadence. And in jazz, the predominant dominant tonic progression generally takes the form of a 2 5 1. So 2 5 1s are really the building blocks of tonal jazz. And they're everywhere in jazz standards, so look for them in every song. And once this cadential progression or functional progression is identified, whether it's a 2 5 1 or anything else, then everything before the predominant is classified as a tonic prolongation, that is, chords that prolong the tonic without a cadence. So a phrase can have a complete cadence, so it ends with a tonic, or you could have an incomplete cadence, so the phrase ending on a dominant chord. So tonic prolongation is literally that. It's chords that just serve to prolong the tonic function. And these are generally just substitutions of the tonic chord, or just quick passing chords. So for example, if we take the chord progression two bars of C major 7, followed by D minor 7 and G7 for half a bar, and back to C major 7, then the functionality of that chord progression is just a tonic for two bars, predominant, dominant, and then tonic. But if we put in some chord substitutions, so C major 7 going to E minor 7, going to A minor 7, going back to C major 7, and then D minor 7, G7, C major 7, we've added some new chords in, but because they're all substitutions of the C major 7 chord, we haven't changed the functionality of the chord progression. Those chords are all tonic prolongation chords. Similarly, if we just add in really quick passing chords that just last for half a bar, for example, putting in an F major 7 or a G7 halfway through the first bar before returning back to the C major 7. Because those chords are so quick and short and they're in the second half of the bar before returning back to the original tonic chord, they're not really adding any new function, they're just kind of passing chords that prolong the tonic, but add a little bit more harmonic interest so we're not just sitting on the same chord for two whole bars. So all of those chord progressions have the tonic function for the first two bars, even though they have a number of different chords. Even the G7 doesn't really sound like a cadence because it's not prepared or preceded by the predominant. So my steps in doing a second level harmonic analysis are as follows. First, we look for and label all two five ones, then we look for tonic prolongation, and finally we look for non-diatonic chords. Again, writing out all the diatonic chords from the key helps with this. So non-diatonic chords can either change the tonal center for a long period of time, in which case we call this modulation, or they can change the tonal center for a short period of time, or not at all in which case it can be either a passing chord, a borrowed chord, or a secondary chord. Now, I have separate videos on all of these topics, so if you don't know what these are, I recommend watching these videos first. Again, because otherwise you might struggle to follow what I'm about to say. So the thing that passing chords, borrowed chords, and secondary chords all share in common is that they are generally very quick and last for no more than half a bar to one bar. And my personal bias is that modulation is a last resort. I try to analyze all non-diatonic chords as passing, borrowed, or secondary chords first, if possible. And only then do I consider modulation. Now again, this is just a personal bias, and you could argue it either way. So looking at section A of my romance, 
The first thing I like to do is to label all the 2-5 movements with brackets, and then label all my 5-1 movements with arrows. Then I find all the 2-5-1 progressions. And then everything else before this 2-5-1 movement is a tonic prolongation. Now we see that everything in bars 1 and 2 is just a tonic prolongation of the C major 7 chord. The F major 7 is just a quick passing chord, the E minor 7 and A minor 7 are both just substitutes of the C major 7 chord, and the E flat diminished, which is an alternate chord given in the lead sheet, is also just a passing chord. Then in bars 3 and 4 we just have a 2-5-1 in C, which we label predominant, dominant and tonic. So that was all in the key of C major. And at the end of bar 4 we have a secondary dominant, which I've labelled SD, with the chord E7 sharp 5, which takes us to the A minor 7 chord, which is of course the relative minor of C major. Then we have another E7 sharp 5 chord, which takes us to yet another A minor 7 chord. So now here, notice that we're playing a 5-1-5-1 chord progression in the key of A minor. Now I would call this a modulation, because it lasts for two bars, which is a relatively long time, and because it's moved to the relative minor, which is a really common key for modulation. And there are no 2-5-1s in the key of A minor. So there's no predominant moving to dominant moving to tonic chord. Instead, the chord progression just moves quite quickly through a 5-1-5-1. So I would say this is just a tonic prolongation of the A minor 7 chord. Then at the end of bar 6, we have another secondary dominant, which is just tonicizing the D minor 7 chord. Then in bars 7 and 8, we just have a 2-5-1 in C. So we've modulated back to the key of C major. So then, to summarise, section A starts in C major, plays a tonic prolongation followed by a 2-5-1, then modulates to the key of A minor for two bars, and returns back to the key of C major for the final two bars with another 2-5-1. This is followed by a secondary dominant which is tonicizing the F major 7, which is the first chord in section B, to which we now turn our attention. So again, the first thing we do is find the 2-5 movements, and then the 5-1 movements. Then we label all the 2-5-1s, the incomplete 2-5s, and the minor 2-5-1 that we have in bars 13 and 14. So now, looking at bars 9 and 10, we start with an F major 7 chord, which is the 4 chord and has a predominant function. This moves to the B flat 7 chord, which is a flat 7 dominant chord. And this is where practice and experience comes in handy. This may look like a bit of a strange progression, but really it's a simple backdoor progression. And the B flat 7 is just a borrowed chord from the parallel minor, that is C Aeolian. And this B flat 7 functions as a plain old dominant chord. So it's still a predominant dominant tonic progression in the key of C. We've just used some modal interchange to make it a bit more interesting. This is then followed by a secondary dominant tonicizing the F major 7 chord, and we go straight into another backdoor progression. So all those chords in bars 9 through 12 are all in the key of C major, even though some of them are not diatonic chords in the key of C. In bars 13 and 14, we have a 2-5-1 in the key of E minor, so obviously we've now modulated to the key of E minor. We then have a B flat 7 moving to an A minor 7. Now the B flat 7 is just a tritone substitution of an E7, which is the 5 chord of the A minor 7. So really, this is just a tritone substitution of a secondary dominant chord. And then in bar 15, we have a 2 5 in G major, which is the relative major of E minor, so that works well. And we finish with a 2-5 back in our original key of C. Okay, so now we've analysed the chord progression, which is great, but now what? What do we do with this information? 
Well, we can use it to influence how we improvise over this chord progression. In the same way that we distinguished between the first level chord progression and the second level chord progression, I'm going to make a similar distinction with improvisation. We can have a first level improvisation or a second level improvisation. So the first level improvisation, which is just the first row under the Roman numerals, simply involves soloing using the relevant mode for each chord. So we could play C Lydian, then F Lydian, then E Dorian, A Dorian, D Dorian, G Mixolydian, C Lydian, E Mixolydian flat 6, A Dorian, E Mixolydian flat 6 again, A Dorian, A Mixolydian flat 6, D Dorian, G Mixolydian, C Lydian, C Mixolydian, F Lydian, B flat Mixolydian, C Lydian, C Mixolydian, F Lydian, B flat Mixolydian, C Lydian, F sharp Locrian, B Mixolydian, E Dorian, B flat Mixolydian, A Dorian, D Mixolydian, D Dorian, G Mixolydian. Now, this is a perfectly fine way to solo, but it has one obvious drawback. Because the chords change every half bar on average, you have to change scales or modes every half bar. Now that was difficult enough just saying each of the scales, let alone playing them. So because the chords change so often, playing a first level improvisation can be a little bit challenging. So instead we could use the second level improvisation. That is, play the scales that relate only to the second level functional important chords. So for the first four bars, I would just play C major. For the end of bar 4 and bars 5 and 6, I would play some kind of A minor scale, emphasizing the G sharp, so like a melodic or a harmonic minor over the E7 chords, and a G natural, so like a natural minor scale, over the A minor 7 chords. And I would just keep playing the A minor scale over the A7, and just play straight through it or straight over it. Because the A7 only lasts for a short period of time, only half a bar, you're only playing the wrong scale for half a bar, so it actually sounds fine. It'll just build up some tension, which you can then resolve with the C major scale in bars 7 and 8. And again, I would just continue playing the C major scale and just play straight through that C7 chord. Again, because it only lasts for half a bar, so it'll be fine. For bars 9, 10, 11 and 12, I would just play the C major scale and just play right through or right over the top of those B flat 7 and C7 chords. Right, so some notes from the C major scale may sound a bit dissonant over those two chords, but that's perfectly fine. After all, it's jazz. Then bars 13 and 14 are in E minor, while bar 15 is in G major which are the relative major and minor keys. So I would just play G major or E natural minor, which have the same notes, over all three of those bars. Right, so it's nice and easy, we're just sticking to one scale. And then finally in bar 16, we return back to the C major scale. Right, now that's much easier than the first level improvisation because we're using far fewer scales. And of course, you would just use these scales as a bass scale from which to depart into more exciting improvisational ideas and techniques, like side slipping or cycled patterns or chromatic runs or whatever. Now I've got a whole playlist on jazz improvisation techniques which you can watch. Right, so even though we have a relatively complex chord progression, by thinking about it on the second level, we can break it down to a few really simple keys and scales, and use those diatonic scales as our basic, bare bones, bass scales, on top of which we add the usual chromaticism that jazz typically exhibits. So as you can see, analysing a chord progression can actually be quite challenging and rather subjective. Again, it's worth repeating that there is more than one way to analyse a chord progression, and my way isn't necessarily 100% definitive. And also note that chord progressions can be far more complex than this. You can also have predominant prolongation and dominant prolongation chords, 
but generally tonic prolongation is the most common. It's also worth mentioning that this second level harmonic analysis only works with functional chord progressions. In more modern jazz, you more often see non-functional chord progressions. That is, the chords do not have the same pull towards a tonic chord or a tonal center. You could have songs that have no obvious tonic chord or tonal center. Now, you can't really analyze non-functional chord progressions using this functional second level harmonic analysis. Instead, you would just stop at the first level. Cool, and that's it for this lesson, and thanks again for watching. See ya.